Hi, Eric. Good evening to you. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes to be interviewed today. My name is Nicolette, and I am the creator for the podcast titled You're Worthless. Read that again. The juxtaposition of your very soul. I would like to read your introduction for our listeners today, and then we can get right into our conversation. Sounds good. Awesome. So, hey, everyone, we have Eric Webster here with us. He is a Grand Rapids, Michigan-based lifestyle engineer, also a hypnotherapist. His, interna his international certifications allow him to work with clients to help them achieve greater outcomes in their lives. Some of his areas of specialization are weight loss, fast life regression, smoking cessation, academic performance, pain management, and many, many more. He is also an Akashic record channel his consultations can shine a light on the why and wherefore of your current life and perhaps the deep roots of the way you are that might come from prior lives okay readings and lab engineering slash hypnosis work can be done in person or online from wherever you are so hello eric i am so intrigued with the Akashic and everything else and also a hypnotherapist because I also just jump into the field of psychology and just got myself certified. So, Very cool. Yes, yes, yes. So Eric, um, can you share with us first, like what was it like growing up as a... Oh, that's a, that's a good, interesting question. <laughs> it gave me great, a great, it gave me great insights later when I could step back away from it. Typical middle class, well, yeah, maybe typical middle-class American household. My father was a law enforcement officer, one cop in a one-cop town. We lived in a real small town. My mother was a registered nurse for her entire career. You know, hunting, fishing, all of the normal American pastimes, though less and less fun attached for much of that for me. And my father and I were at my odds quite often. Later, later in life, we were estranged for many, many years. But I got to a place where through a lot of studying and meditation and forgiveness work, where I realized that we had a sacred contract. Carolyn Mace writes about those, and I find that to be really compelling. He agreed to be that father that he was so that I could grow up to be the man that I am. And I do believe that we either learn how to or how not to from everybody in our lives. And he was a wonderful example of how not to in many areas. He was not a bad man. I do believe he did the best he knew how to do from where he was. Um, he had a lot of inclinations and behaviors that were not acceptable to me then. And I would certainly never be a part of any of that as an adult. But Graduated high school, went to college, dropped out of college eventually, did 20 years in the restaurant business and 30 years as a residential realtor. And now for the last dozen years, I've been doing hypnosis and Akashic Records and writing and, pod and podcasting and uh, blogging and all of the, the stuff that you're supposed to do today. Wow. I love that, that old mantra at the back. I uh, I have one here on my wrist as well. I love it. And I, I think I resonated with your profile because of the spiritual aspect of your journey the most. Yeah, I resonated with that the most. And I wanted to go to that part where you, you're also an Akashic Record channel. So talk to us about that. If you okay. <laughs> it's it's one, of, one of my favorite parts of everything that I do. The Akashic Record is the complete history of your soul, all lifetimes, past, okay. present, and future. So wow. it, in this human incarnation, it's quite likely that we have other people who are in our lives this time who had been in our lifetimes in prior times, various roles, various genders. I do believe I'm a beautiful Great Pyrenees lab mixed dog. His name is Clyde, and he and I have discovered that he and I were brothers in another lifetime, and we have such an incredible connection. He knows me so well. Used to think that dogs came to get love when they needed it. They totally come. Clyde comes to snuggle when I need it, and then he looks up at me like, okay, are you okay now, Dad? It's just a wonderful thing. But so often there are things in our prior lifetimes that can shade or hinder, in some cases, where we are and what we're doing in this lifetime. 
One that comes up quite often is if people are having poverty issues, trouble with money, it seems like oftentimes in another lifetime, they were a minister or a priest or a nun. And especially with priest or nun, they would have taken vows of poverty and chastity, you know, for their role within the Catholic Church. And I always thought that when we died and then got a new life, that all of those vows would be vacated automatically. But, but I really have seen some cases where we go through a little exercise of vacating and declaring any vows that are not appropriately valid for me in this lifetime are hereby vacated, and things, things seem to shift around for them. I can't think of too many areas where a vow of poverty and a vow of chastity could be kind of limiting in our human experience this go. So I may have found that to be very fascinating. Those same people oftentimes have a bit of a distaste for organized religion. And if, because if you've been on the inside another time in another place, the record keepers laugh and they say, yeah, once you've seen how the sausage is made, you kind of lose your appetite for sausage. And mm -hmm. there are cases where that experience has left them with no desire to be actively involved. But children, spouses, oftentimes have been important parts of our lifetimes in other times and places. And I do, as a hypnotherapist, I also do past life regression. Mm -hmm. So we can actually go visiting, which can be kind of fun as well. Past life regression, not childhood regression. Past, past life, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, had one, I had one young man who came a few years ago, and one of the lifetimes that we went to, he was a submarine commander in the German Navy during the war. And they were in a minefield, depth charges, and just as the one blew up, that was going to take his life, he was pulled out and taken to his home back in Germany, again, as a visitor. And he was there watching when the Navy came on Christmas Eve to tell his wife and two children that he was lost in combat. And then they immediately took him back to the sub, and he saw a body of him in that lifetime floating because the sub was totally full of water. In the experience of that, he was told that his current wife and his current two children mm -hmm. were the same souls as his wife and two children in that lifetime. And as we talked about it, it was like, yeah, that makes me feel like you probably weren't really supposed to die right then. And so it's like you're getting a do-over. But in the, in the regression, he found, he heard or saw the name of who he was, and he did some research. He found that in that general time frame, there were only two submarine commanders with that first name, and the other one had died a few years before when we went visiting. So he had, he's like 95% sure he knows the name of the person he was in that lifetime. I told him he should do a ancestry DNA and see if that guy shows up, because yeah. would that be interesting? I just got a, I just got chills when you said it's, about the... Uh... Uh, it's fun work. It's really fun work. So how so, do you regress people? Like, what is that step to regress well, two, them? two different ways, and I kind of go with how spirit leads me, because okay. everything I do is sort of on that basis. Either do the hypnotic process and get them deeply relaxed, just like a normal hypnosis session. And we either go to the library of the Akashic Record and we're led to their alcove where all the volumes of their lifetimes are, you know, great big leather bound editions. And the record keeper will pull certain ones off the shelf and open them up. And then words or phrases or paragraphs will sort of jump off the page to draw their attention to it. Other times we go, it's like I walk backward in increasingly large steps through time, and they tell me where to stop. And it may be in the 1800s, could be in the 1700s. I think I had one, one woman recently that we got all the way back to, I think we went A.D. I think we were like 200 A.D., which I'd never, never experienced that before, going back that far. And then with her... She got the year, and I said, so where are we going next? And she, and it was like 1837 or something. But normally, I just go backward and forward, 
50, 50 year increments. And then I'd say, when we're close, you tell me to stop. And then I, I narrow it in. So I know, you know, r- what year we are. And then I ask them, describe for me where you are. Are you a man or are you a woman? What are the surroundings like? Are you in a city? Are you in the country? Uh, are you in your home? And, and we get remarkably clear images. These folks get wonderful images of who they are. We go back, though, as an observer, because I don't know what we're going to find when we get there. And I don't ever want to take somebody, for example, to France and have their head be in the rack for the guillotine just before the blade comes down. Never have had anything violent like that. But we always go back as an observer. But then I've gotten where I have, have them have interaction with the person has their soul in that lifetime. And, I'll, and one of the questions I ask them to pose to that soul, what would you like me to know today? What's the most important thing that you would like me to take back with me from this visit? And man, sometimes it's just the most profound, resonating, oh my God, that clears up so much in my life. I never know. I mean, I truly never know where we're going to go, who we're going to see. I don't get the, you know, oh, you were Cleopatra or you were, you know, Pope John or, or what any of that sort of stuff. But I guess I guess it's conceivable one day that we could. Well, uh, I, don't, I have so many questions right now. Uh, I'm so compelled to say, okay, so can you do it like, but you like uh, like a glance for like an Akashic record, you have to do it like a session? Or can you like look at a person and say, like maybe get a glimpse of what the person is, who he or she was before, like why? I don't, uh, I don't generally get who they were before. I do get a gut read yeah, in terms of, read. oh, here's somebody I want to steer clear of, or this looks like a really interesting person. And years ago, I've been married now, for 12 years, and I divorced after 30 years, 15 years ago? Yeah, I was 55, and I'm 70 now, so 15 years ago, wow. I divorced, and um, 70. <laughs> I'll be 71 you, next month. Really? You you, you look around your 60s, well, in your 60s, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm 60s with 10 years experience, so, um, but I'm still just incredibly childish. I don't know that I could say I'm childlike, but I sure can be childish. But but I was on one of one or two of the dating apps, you know, match.com or or I forget what the other there was one I liked better. Uh eHarmony. I'd look at I'd look at the matches and I go, Oh, well, that she looks like an interesting person. I bet she'd be interesting to have a glass of wine with or have lunch with or whatever. But I really had a sense of a woman who was walking toward me, uh, ended up being the woman I married. And we reconnected. We knew each other 40 years before. She'd been married. Her husband died. He and I were old drinking buddies and golf buddies way back in the 70s before they even got together. And I called her Gwen because I knew we'd been in another lifetime together. And um Oh my God. <laughs> we re- we reconnected on match, and I don't know, two weeks later, she was down in Florida on vacation, and I flew down for five nights, and uh, I think it was the second night, I said, you know, I'd marry you, and we'd email back and forth a lot and talked on the phone a lot in the meantime. I said, I'd marry you down here right now, but our, our families would just have a stroke if we did that. <laughs> so why don't we wait until August, and we got married that August. Oh my God. That is such a... A remarkable story. Sometimes you just pull towards that person, right? You just don't know how or why, but somehow the universe is like, it's orchestrating it for you. Yep. And we we both pretty strongly believe that David, her deceased husband, my former buddy, pulled some strings from the other side. Well, and because she told stories about how David used to speak very highly of me that I was, you know, a man of good character and that I had been a good friend. And we had lost touch. I don't think I'd seen them in 30 years. And I didn't even realize David had died. Um, so then we, then Beth and I reconnect, we reconnected. We knew each other way back, just very casually. Uh, but it didn't take long. And we were like, oh, okay, let's do this. Just like that. 
<laughs> As if by magic. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say, Eric, that our Akashic record made us who we are right now? And who we're meant to be in our, like our higher. Mostly, or at least in large part, I think my belief of it is that when we're on the spirit side, mm -hmm. we put together a prospectus of oh, oh, perspective. what the life is going to be. What oh, do we want to so learn? we chose this right now. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, that's, that is kind of a double edged sword, isn't it? When yes. we look at our lives. Exactly. Oh man, why did I pick? Why? Yeah. Especially when you but, start learning into spirituality and you're like, huh, we actually chose this life that we have right now. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then we have that contract meeting mm. with all the people that are going to be a, an important part of this life if we win. Oh. And we say, okay, I need you to this or that. I need you to come in and break my oh. heart or kick my butt or, Just... you know, whatever it is. Which I, which I, I believe it. also. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew why all those things are happening to me. It's because I said, see, I ordained it. It's almost like I ordained it. You do this to me. I know I'm strong enough to go through this. But it's, exactly it's right. And, and the place that I finally got to with some of the people in my life with mm. that understanding was they loved me enough to do the things that they did. Because I asked him to, and for my own good, and for my own growth, and I do believe that in some cases there can be a, a bit of a, okay, I was a real rat bastard then. I need to pay for that this time, so you come in, whatever, and then, and then the score gets sort of evened out so that we don't have to carry that forward. And, and the, you know, what I don't know about all of this is incredibly big, mm. but that's kind of in a nutshell my belief system around how it kind of works. I believe it too. And now because we're here to just remember, right? Putting them back together. Remember to learn, to teach, to love, to be, mm. to be a source of light and love in a world that seems to have a little shortage of light and love lately. But I really do believe that it doesn't take a whole lot of people Focusing on what's good and decent and powerful, loving and kind to offset and override any of the people that are purely about domination and separation and power, and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And the fun thing, actually, life is pretty fun overall. But one of the things that I've been noticing, they quote unquote, post COVID world, even though we're not really post COVID, it's just it isn't the critical pandemic that it was a while back. It seems to me that there are a lot of people that are suddenly jumping on a spiritual bandwagon. And mm -hmm. they're like, oh, wait, there's got to be more. Life has got to be about more than getting up, drinking three cups of coffee, and then dragging myself through a day doing work that I hate so I can go home and sit on the sofa and watch stupid <laughs> stuff on television and kick the dog and yell at my kids and go to bed and get up and do it again. And so I really do think that there's a remarkable number of new people and they're not new souls, but in this lifetime, I think that they're, they're sort of the lights are going and they're like, okay, this is, I'm really drawn to tarot cards or Reiki yes. or my, oh <laughs> my aunt Mildred is talking to me. I guess I have some mediumship skills. Um, you know, there's such a there's such a vast buffet of all of that out there. And and more and more people seem to be stepping up to the table. And I just love that. I love that too. So are you working a job that you're not wild about? You probably don't want to say because your boss <laughs> might watch. I just moved out from my nine to five, Eric, uh back okay. in May. So June was the first month that I'm on my own. So right now I am trying to finish off some certification for my life coaching i've graduated from hypnotherapy but then it's just this and me having the podcast is to sort of like a, make it like a training ground for me to speak to people and i actually have a knack for it i love it so right You're now very I'm, good oh thank you thank you that means a lot and then it's like when you have so many people around you that are working that that are not doing what you're doing, you feel left out. You feel like you're alienated. If not most of the time, it's like, am I on the right path? But 
I cannot walk away from divination once I, once I've had the taste of it. I cannot walk away from being psychic or being intuitive or just caring for people. And I tried to look like read online like I saw I think last night before going to bed. I'm like signs of deep loneliness like why are you overly sharing to people? Why are you like being so I don't know, kind and I'm like Am I diagnosing myself in deep loneliness? I'm like, no, 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 no. But it feels like, it feels right. I don't know. Sometimes I'm continuing. I'm, I'm speaking. I'm getting up in the morning to come and speak to you. Again, right now, I'm getting like sides from the universe saying that you are on the right. I love that. I used to be, to be a control freak because um, I used to be an overachiever. People may take that as a negative word. I, I, I took it as a negative, but it's like, I used to chase with material things. So right now, if you're doing something, I'm doing something on my own. So it's not kind of stable yet. And I am very, how do I say, you know, the the income, it's not, it's not there just that you're, when you're used to getting the paycheck, yeah. it's, it's like a drug. Yeah. It's like a drug. Shit. And isn't that what the entire system was built upon? Yeah. As I'm having Create, some control. In yeah. I just, Creating that false sense that we all need more, 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 fancier, more expensive stuff, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And and so we trade the hours of our life. We trade our life for a, a paycheck so we can buy more stuff. And it ends up that we don't own the stuff. The stuff owns us. And when you're stepping out like you are right now, my guess would be that in the process of preparing for this, you went through a whole examination, personal examination of your life and what do you really need? What do you really want? How do you, do you really want to live and spend your life? And I bet you found that it was a whole lot simpler than when you had that carrot on the hanging yeah. in front of you. But, but don't you think that we're all one degree or another by our parents, by our teachers, by our siblings, by our partners programmed? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know. I, 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 did, I don't know that. I, it, I'm not a woman in this lifetime, but for me, it just seems like, especially for men, but it could easily be equally for women today, that we define ourselves not on who we are, but we define ourselves on what we do. You go to a party, yes. and what's the question? What do you do? What do you do for a living? And then you get the look. So, and I but, call, I'm a podcaster now. Oh. <laughs> I'm a hypnotherapist and an yeah, Akashic the Record channel. That blows some yeah. hair back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went back. So I left my job in May, right? So I went back in. I went back to my hometown to see my parents because I was feeling kind of lonely here in where I am, KL. And then I looked at them again. I'm like, did I, did I really sign up for this? And then I went, I came back again to KL and then... I went back again in July. I just flew back in actually yesterday. And I was like, no, I really need to step away from that nine to five. Because I was talking to my dad and he was like, are you sure you're going to be able to support yourself? I don't know. I know what I do know. I don't want to go back. Yeah. And and I've always, I was raised to, he raised me, I would say, in a way that you need to be focused, Nicolette. And then you need to be able to get that job get a good grade and position until life humbled me with my own divorce as well. And then COVID and, and burnout at a prestigious firm that I thought um, like, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, now you've why arrived. would I want to Yeah, yes. And, and it all came crumbling down. And again, I had to, I had to lose myself. Right now, I'm still finding myself, Eric to be honest but it's like it's the worry but then i don't know but i know it's gonna be okay in the end yeah one of my one of my favorite cliches and i i honestly don't know where it came from but it's it'll all be fine in the end and it's if it's not, not fine end, it, if it's not it's, fine it's not the end it's not the end yeah thank you i needed that so what is virtual gastric band virtual gastric band is a hypnotherapy based uh -huh. reset of the relationship with eating and with food. The short answer is, under hypnosis, I convince a person's subconscious mind 
that I put a band around the top part of their stomach, creating a small pouch, oh. just like just like a lap band surgery would. But but it goes so much deeper than that because again, through our culture and our upbringing, we were taught when we're born we cry when we're hungry, and when we've had enough to eat, we stop. If a mom or a dad gives their baby more bottle or insists that they drink more than they want or need. They're going to throw it right back up because that wisdom relative to taking on how much nutrition we need, that's all part of the original programming that we brought in with us. But as we grow, we're taught if there's still food on your plate, you're still hungry. Clean up your plate. You'll be a big boy. You'll be a big girl. All the all the parental guilt stuff, you know, and you can't say no. Just pack it up and send it to those kids in Africa then. Yes. You know, because all the guilt trip stuff. Correct. And and then if we do that, then our reward is ice cream or cake or pie or something. At least here in the U.S., I'm not sure about Asian. Asian cultures, from the little bit I know, y'all seem to be better about eating healthy things and honoring <laughs> your bodies. And I'm sure that not everybody does. Mm -hmm. um, and we're taught then when we fall off our bicycles, oh, honey, come on in, have a little ice cream. That'll make it all better. So no matter what our boo-boo is, food is going to be the balm that heals it. And so then we get busy and we don't eat because we're hungry. We eat because we're sad, we're lonely, we're bored, we're angry, we're frustrated, or it's mealtime. But we got to get this report done. So we're banging away at the computer while we're eating. And so we short circuit that wisdom, that signal from our stomach to our brain that says you've had enough. So that we can push away the plate until all of a sudden we're like, oh, I ate too much and I'm miserable. Yeah. And so this sort of resets all of that back to the factory settings of taking on exactly what your body needs in any <laughs> in any meal time. I remember my first guest on the show said to me, like, the biggest addiction right now in the world is not drugs, it's actually food. Yep. And and other substances that people get addicted to, if they really work at it and are committed, they can walk away from it. An alcoholic can be sober for the rest of their lives. With food, you got to eat. So it, it's about restructuring all of that relationship. It's real interesting that, and I know I know that this can be the case in regular medical type settings. But I really see a lot of people that when they come in, what they're wanting me to help them treat is the symptom of an underlying issue. And yeah. so, but see, when you're working in the subconscious mind, you're going, you're going all the way to the core. And that's where, that's where the heavy lifting gets stuck. I love it. Okay, Eric. So like you mentioned, hypnotherapy. So that virtual gastric band is actually done when you're doing your hypnotherapy, right? What are the other other situations that can help a person change their life and outcomes? With hypnosis? Yeah. Well, the virtual gastric band is year in and year out number one. I work more of that than anything else. Smoking I'm going to do cessation, hypnosis on myself. Yeah, there you go. And you can. <laughs> you absolutely yes. can. Smoking would be number two. Athletic performance and academic performance, exam stress, those are pretty regular. Sleep pattern, helping people sleep better is a big one. Just general fears, phobias, and anxiety, fear of flying, fear of height. Gosh, there have been, there've been just so many. I really do believe that behaviorally, there, there aren't many things that hypnosis can't really be powerfully impactful for. As I said, I don't work with people who are actively drug addicted. I have worked with a number of people that wanted to modify their relationship with alcohol and take better control over it. But if somebody was like, you know, a skid row wino type alcoholic, that's a that's a higher skill set and training than I have. I know people, mm -hmm. so I would be able to refer them. Mm -hmm. But gosh, it's it's really helping people to step tap into out of their yeah, because step whatever out of is, their brokenness and become who they truly are. Yeah, yeah. It's because the issues that you have right now is somewhat, somehow related to something that happened during your childhood or, I don't know, you're going back to past life even. I'm not sure if that yep. is connected to the... I think it's possible. Hang on one the, second. Yeah, sure. I, I have to sneeze. Oh, bless you. Nope. 
It's teasing. Ah, there. Okay. <laughs> okay. It was it was teasing me and playing hard to get. It it is. I don't know. It's such gratifying. And the, and the overlap of positive factors doesn't matter what the what they're wanting to leave behind. The overlap of causative factors is so remarkable. And and so I work with people about reclaiming their power. I work with people about forgiveness. That's that's absolutely enormous. And I'll I'll plug it's free, so I'm not selling anything. On my website, ericwebster.com, E-R-I-C Webster like the dictionary, there's a whole section called free tools and it's pretty much all about forgiveness and meditations and writing exercises the theater of the mind is what got me really on the forgiveness wagon and i could tell you wish i had photos to prove it but i'm telling you the truth i swear to god i meditation one night with my father as the recipient of the forgiveness and i'd done 20 years of forgiveness work And really felt like I was pretty neutral in that regard with him and our relationship. Did that theater of the mind one night, and the next night when I went to wash my face, I still had hair then, something was different. (laughs) And for 35 years, I'd had a scar on my forehead where a canoe paddle had bounced off my head accidentally. And I I really do not believe that it was an intentional you know, hit me in the head with a canoe paddle thing. But the scar and the bump that had been under it for 35 years were 100% erased from my physical body. Oh, my God. And I went, this means something, you know, if if a single... I had that kind of, I mean, I don't have, but I had similar experience where there was a scar I noticed growing up. And then I don't know, I don't know exactly what I did, but then it's no longer there. Yeah, Ooh. so for me, single act of forgiveness was transformational in my physical body. That was just a sign of how powerful it was. Yeah. The real the real power was everywhere else. Mm-hmm. So that's that's why I'm I'm a huge proponent of forgiveness. Yeah. Because it's about yourself. It's not about the other person. Yeah, that lack of forgiveness will eat the container. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I look at I look mm-hmm. at people that are always angry and mad and nasty. Nasty, mean. And I just wonder sometimes if all that ends up becoming a cancer. They're carrying just such a massive amount of poison around. Around you. I have to believe that it's conceivable that that eats them up literally and figuratively. And that doesn't suggest that everybody that gets cancer is angry and, you know, yeah. created it and it's not blaming the victim, and I want to be really clear about that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But it is a factor, yeah, especially so. when you're, yeah. And because now that I know that everything is energy, right? And everything that you touch upon, the water that you drink, the mind you create, the thing that you create in your mind creates your reality. So I'm very, very careful with the words that I use, what comes out of my mouth. And, and but yep. it's, I don't know, Eric. Is it hard for you to stay kind? <laughs> Some days. Some days, yeah. Some yeah, days, they yeah. really do test you. Um, but, but I really, I, the last, I don't know, the last four or five months, I've really been, my business has been a little quiet. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, well, I guess it's time for me to do some of my own work here. And so I've been reading a little more, watching, you know, some uplifting things. I took a couple of classes online with Mike Dooley from tut.com channeling class Ooh. that was really quite lovely. And now uh, I have signed up for, it was a 21-day meditation series with David G. David, David J.I. He mm. has a wild white hair and a big white beard, and he has just a <laughs> wonderful voice uh, for recorded. And so I'm, a, I'm way behind on that. But it's all, I have lifetime access to it. So when I have a minute, I go sit in my hypnosis recliner and put my headset on and and do a, you know, a 20 minute meditation with them. But I've really, really been working on uh, peaceful, internal peace. And I, I go back mm-hmm. time and again to the St. Francis of Assisi prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And I really, I mean, I read that a lot. It it just seems so powerful and fitting. And this now this morning, I, I've had a couple of days where I've been kind of 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so this morning when I woke up, Big Clyde, my dog, hopped up on the bed to snuggle with me, which was a great way to start the day. But I wasn't even fully awake yet this morning, and I'm like, okay, I am grateful. I am joyful. I am powerful. Everything, every word that I was seeking and saying out loud in my head um, ended with full. And I was, I was kind of surprised by how many, how many there were. And I can tell you honestly that that exercise really shifted me around this morning in a wonderful way. And so I think that that probably is going to be a new part of my morning waking up. For a very long time, I work on having my first thought be, thank you. I know that there are a lot of people every single morning that wake up dead. And I'm so incredibly grateful each day when my eyes open that I wasn't one of them. And at maybe 70 years old, I have a a different perspective on, you know, we truly do not know when our when our clock runs out. I've I've said goodbye to a lot of friends in the last five years, um, and I'm grateful. It, it's a it's a you know I think that doing all the the spiritual work and the akashic all that stuff, mm. I think it really changes. It has changed my perception of death. And we yeah. have a farm, so we have horses and donkeys and goats and dogs and. So over the years, we've said goodbye to a lot of four-legged friends. And but I always, I always go out. You know, if we know that the vet's coming, and I go out, talk to them, tell them how loved they are, how much we appreciate what the, they brought to our lives, and and I'm the one that holds the rope when it's time for them to go. And every time the vet says, "Are you sure?" And I'm, "Yep." I want the last face they see to be a face that they know. A face of someone they know loves them, and that's just you know. One day, one day we put two beautiful horses down. They were born in my wife's barn thirty years before, and they were they were boyfriend and girlfriend. And but he had a wandering eye, and she always took him back. <laughs> and it, it's kind of a kind of a soap opera. A telenovela but, between the horses. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there was it was Sarge and Nina, and I was just barely hanging on by a thread mm. and i got in my jeep to drive to the house to take a shower to come to my office and as soon as i started the rolling stones wild horses i was done i just put a fork in me i'm done but I, but i tell them you know in the run up to goodbye i say oh my god you're going to see you're going to see sarge and nina and bo and you know all the all their four legged family that's already and your tired old body is going to be left here, and we'll take care of that. And you'll be young and energetic and be able to run in the pasture. And I just know um, that, that that makes their exiting not so scary for them. And that the reunion they have when they get there. We had a great day, and he gave the best hugs. And when it was his time, I said, okay, buddy, when I get there, you better be in the front row because I'm going to want a Sherman hug really bad. And he promised me that he would be. So I Aww. can't help it. I'm a, I'm a weird old guy. What can I tell you? No, the, the thing is, I'm resonating. Uh, yeah. And um, okay, so Eric, I am going to pivot to a self word question because my podcast talks a lot about self word. And I have a question for each of my guests. And the question for you is, many people struggle with feelings of worthlessness at some point in their lives. What are the common triggers for these feelings and how can individuals cope with them? That's a wonderful question because you're right. It's so incredibly widespread. But I think that I think that there's so many walking wounded that for their entire life, the message that they got was that they were not good enough. They were not important enough that no matter what they did, it wouldn't be enough. People have been taught you have to be nearly perfect. And if you really are nearly perfect, you might find somebody who could love you. And consequently, if you're not feeling particularly loved, look in the mirror and find your own imperfection because it's your fault. Well, that's just nonsense, okay? But but it cues us. And, and I really do believe that that. By and large, the people that deliver those words and those messages mean well. There are some there are some horrible parents out there, make no mistake. But I think by and large, it's people 
well-meaning people that want their sons and daughters to grow up and be upstanding members of the community and work hard and prosper and all of that stuff. But it creates a situation where if our nose isn't on the grindstone, we have no value. Mm. And if if we're, our life, if we're not perfect, we suck. And, you know, we're human. So perfect isn't even on the menu. And, and I like to remind people, and, and some days I have to remind myself, oftentimes, that just sitting here on my, at my desk, sitting on the deck, watching the horse, whatever I'm doing, I am enough. You are enough. The creator in whose image you were made looks at you and says, man, I did some pretty good work. I believe that that Christ, that creator, isn't some guy in the sky with a beard. I believe it's her, and I believe that she is in, there's an aspect of her within each of us. One day, one day years ago, I was meditating, and I was, I was in a tough, tough moment in my life, and I was beating myself up quite a bit. Oh, this is a story I don't tell very often. Interesting. That meditation ended up being a conversation with the Creator. And she looked at me, and she said, Eric, when I look at you, I'm really proud. I'm really happy your creation and, and who you are. Do you think you know better than me? Who the hell do you think you are to be so hard on you? And I want to tell you, that was a, that was a game changer for me. And, and I mean, I'm not delusional. I don't do drugs, you know. It was nine in the morning. I had a cup of coffee there probably, but, but it was very real. It was, an, it, was an, it was as real as this conversation with you is. And it's like, how, how dare I see myself in tiny terms, which then leads to, how can I see anybody else, two-legged, four-legged, wing, crawling on their bellies like a snake, the trees, the plant? How can I see any of that creation without seeing the sacredness that's in it? I mean, the horses, they're so wise. They're such good listeners, and they love Reiki. <laughs> Really? Yeah, yeah. The donkeys, the donkeys are especially boisterous when I'm doing Reiki in the bar. They love Whoa. it. So, yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh, there is a reason why we need to speak today. Um. And how I... funny is it that on that pod, for those that, <laughs> that aren't said, familiar, it was you, it was it's you like that a, said, um, they kept watching. It's like a dating site for pod hosts and pod guests and and the choice as a guest which is how i'm registered is communicate maybe later or no and i hit maybe later i bet three times within 36 hours yours kept and finally the fourth time i'm like okay i guess i really need to take a better look at this because clearly the universe wants me to at least make a proposal to come on your podcast I'm really glad I did. Oh my god, I just had a I had an epiphany as well. I was feeling so down the last couple of days and I'm like, I needed some boost. And here you are. Again, I feel like I'm renewed. Well, thank you. I love thank that. you. So Eric, a couple more questions and then we can wrap this up. What is your heart's greatest wish? I guess the big picture one tracks along with John Lennon's song Imagine. The world could live as one. I I yeah, that that would be like the, the global one. I guess that's the macro. And on the micro, it would be for, for me to get to that internal level of peace and to, to do what I'm doing bigger. Not, and I'm not, I'm not talking about like I want to become Wayne Dyer or anything, but I really feel like I really feel like what I do has the potential to really help people in their lives and so i'm working on some books intermittently but but to work on maybe a larger a larger scale with some of this stuff to, to have a greater impact and again it's about the impact it isn't about you know oh, look at eric Rester, isn't he amazing get that light off of me but but it's about i guess helping people find their own power, their own beauty, their own truth. Or maybe it's a martini on my deck with a good cigar and my dog. I don't know. <laughs> I'm flexible that, that way. Too. I love that. Thank you. Do you have a mantra that you live by? Yeah, I, I probably have a few. And one of them, I made a meme out of it with a picture of one of our donkeys, Sally. She's a beautiful girl. And, and uh, it, uh, 
it's a reminder that says there's no situation that can't be made worse if you act like an ass. So I I printed that out and I've shared it on Facebook. That that's a good one. And then earlier I said uh, it'll all be fine in the end, and if it's not fine, it's not the end. And that's one that's one that has helped me through some days where maybe I was struggling more than I needed to. My last name's Webster, so I get my words wholesale. I think you're you're impacting one person right now, and that's me. Oh, I'm so happy. Yeah. Is there anything that keeps you up at night, or do you sleep well? No, it's it's really rare when I when it's time for me to turn everything off. Uh, which is earlier than it used to be. I used to be an 1130 guy, and now I'm kind of a 1030 guy. Part of that is there's nothing worth watching on 10 o'clock. So if there was, I'd probably be up to 11. But um, I put on I have earbuds, and I pull up a meditation or a, a recording of some kind or a self-hypnosis recording. And normally they're 20 minutes, and I'm rarely still awake by the time that finishes and then at some point i'll move my head and i'll go your butts are still in and i you know drop them on the nightstand and normally i'll normally i'll get up at 3 30 to use the bathroom for a minute and if i'm lucky i'll i'll sleep until 5 30 or 6 but no I, not much not much keeps me up so yeah. you were saying that i was just thinking like why am i bothered so much about the noise like I could, like you, you're just focusing on your meditation, your sleeping time, you meditate, you listen to your own hypnosis, and then you wake up, and then your day starts again. Yeah. It's the... I, I have an mm. iPad on a speaker thing on the dresser, and I have ocean ocean waves with subliminal messaging wow. underneath, and that goes all night long. And I live out in the country, you know, the sky is dark, and there's not traffic or sirens or any of that sort of thing either. Occasionally, a deer will run through the backyard and one of the dogs <laughs> will start barking, but, but not much. And that's more in the full moon because they'll, they'll see it, you know, because it's bright. Right, but, yeah. But, um, yeah, I've really, I've really worked hard and continue to. I work, work on focusing, recognizing when something is mine to change, mm -hmm. but more importantly, recognizing when it isn't. And realizing mm. that the world has turned on its axis for thousands of years without my hand on the controls. Yeah. And if I let go of the controls, go. it's going to continue to turn. And so it's that, that's been a hard one because I, I have latent control freak tendencies also. Um, high, mm. high expectations, probably a shorter fuse than mm. is appropriate for you know, everything that's going on in the world. It, it is a time that that does test my ability to not judge people. There's a lot going on that I'm like, oh, <laughs> I never would have thought you would believe that, but it'll all be fine in the end. <laughs> if, it's not the, if it's not fine, it's not the end. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, one final question. If you could create a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening and the world as your legacy, what would it be? Always that you were, in fact, created in the divine image of God by whatever name you call her, and that you are enough. You are absolutely enough. That's just off the top of my head. Thank and you. Without hair, they slide right <laughs> off real easy. So, My favorite. My You're favorite. You're funny too, Eric. My favorite hair quote is Wayne Dyer. What? And Wayne Wayne said, you know, God created very few perfect heads. And he covered the rest of them with hair. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Eric, how can people reach out to you? My, the easiest way is my website, ericwebster.com. I do a lot of work on Zoom. And I, can, and I do. One of the things that people can sign up for on the website is a free 30-minute consultation. So if people just want to say, okay, what would, you know, how could we work with this, or do a little exploratory thing? I'm always thrilled to do those, but they can book Akashic Record readings in various lengths. Next week, I start another round of classes teaching people Akashic Record, six, six o'clock in the evening. Uh, okay, so Eastern, it's 6 a.m. for me. <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we go from six until nine and on Zoom. Three hours on the 7th, 
And then two weeks later, three hours, we do level one the first time, level two, which is with permission, opening the record of other people. Um, and I actually partner the people in the class off and they open each other's records and wow. do exercises in the class. And after, after you've taken those cl two classes, anytime I offer them, you're encouraged and welcome to take them again over and over and over at no additional cost. So that's, that also is on the website. So ericwebster.com. Okay. okay. I am, I'm interested. I'll check it out. Okay. Okay. And if I needed to do, if I needed to do a different time, I wouldn't want to start it as late as eight o'clock like we did tonight. Yeah. It, that would be 11 o'clock at night before I'm done. And I, my house is a half an hour from my office. So that'd be 1130. I, tr I would probably turn into a pumpkin before <laughs> I got home. So, but yeah. 6 p.m. is good. So if I were okay. to join you, it's 6 a.m. on my side. So that's perfect. Okay. okay. Yeah. What a way to start the day. Yes. And anybody that signs up for both of the classes, they're $100 per. Anybody that signs up for both of them, the bonus, rather than a discount, I give them a free 30-minute reading. So that, there's awesome. your carrot. There's your carrot. What, that's a bargain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and see, for me, it's more about uh, empowering people. It's about giving, helping people discover the tools that are going to help them. When I, when I do hypnosis, I'll always have my Eric Webster lifestyle engineer Akashic record open because I know that the feed I'm getting every single time, there'll be a moment where I'll look up and go, good one, thank you. Because the concept would be where I was going, but the phrasing and the wording would be so much more laser focused than I probably would have come up with on my own. Fun stuff. Thank you so much, Eric. This has I been had a ball. A great time. Yeah, and there you have it, guys. You heard it from the person himself, Eric Webster. Before we close off, Eric, I'd like to thank you personally for the work that you're doing for the world and for advancing every step mm -hmm. of the way, despite the challenges, creating trails for those that will come after you. The listeners, this has been that one podcast with that controversial name, Your Wordless. Read that again. The juxtaposition of your very soul. Now, if you find yourself thinking that you are wordless, you're probably not alone. But more importantly, ask yourself a level deeper. If I'm wordless, then why the heck am I here? It is because your soul has chosen to be here energetically all the way from the ethers. And for that reason itself, you are worthy and you are enough. This has been Eric Webster, your guest of the day. And Nick Nieras, your host, signing off. Thank you so much, Eric, for your time. My absolute pleasure. So nice to meet you. Likewise. Eric, 